Okay. Can every in the room hear me? Okay. Can everybody in Zoom land hear me? Ron, would you give me a thumbs up if you can hear me? Excellent. All right. So uh, after 18 months, welcome back. Uh, you'll notice I'm not standing up front. I've suckered Dave into that job today. Uh, our illustrious president had other commitments this week. So um, one thing that is new is that when we do announcements and stuff, such that the people online can participate. Um, we've got two wireless microphones now. The presenter up front will have one. And then I've got the other one. If you want to say something, just uh, raise your hand, holler at us, do something. I'll bring the mic over, and that way everybody can hear. So thanks. That, Dave, take it away. All right, am I on? And I'm, I'm guessing those of you out in TV land can hear me too. All right, uh, so as Nathan mentioned, uh, our president, Denny Leonard, is uh, out of town on business. I think he's uh, probably dining in Wisconsin this afternoon or evening or something like that. I'll have to remember how to do this because we haven't uh, been in a, a crowd of faces. We've got about 35 people here tonight. For You'll just have to trust me on that because you can't see them. Um, okay, so welcome to the October two, 2021 meeting, Rocky Mountain Railroad Club. Normally, we would uh, have announcements if anybody had anything, but usually our biggest uh, contributor to that is Chip Sherman, and I think he's riding a train today. Um, I think he's on the Mountaineer, Joe. So, yeah, it's not Joe's day to watch him, but Joe McMillan's here. He's got a table set up with some books, and Dan Edwards is here with a table set up with some books. Um, I guess uh, since there's not a whole lot for me to say, I guess we may as well just go ahead and get into our, our first program. Um, Dan, do you want to, do you want to lead us off and give us a little spiel here? All right, good evening. It's, yes, it's good to be back after 18 months or so here at uh, Christ Church uh, in Denver. I want to present a new book that I've prepared called Chasing Railroad History. It's a, written as a tribute to five charter members of our club. And the... Uh, And it consists of letters that were written to my dad, Walker Edwards, by Jim Gwynn, Dick Kindig, and Otto Perry from about 1926 uh, into the 1950s. And then a separate collection of letters by Jack Thode that I'll talk about in a few minutes. So let's meet uh, the, our char charter members. Nathan, I'm pushing him. So this is my dad, Walker Edwards, in 1939, just after the club was founded. He was born in Denver in 1910, and he got his railroad interest from his grandfather, John M. Walker, who came to Colorado in 1880 and worked as a train master in, at Pueblo for the Denver Rio Grande, and then he became superintendent of telegraph so he, until 1923. So dad was at the opening of the Moffat Tunnel in 1928, and at the opening of the Dot Cerro Cutoff in 1934, and he and Jim Quinn rode the last narrow gauge passenger train from Leadville to Denver in 1937. For most of uh, his career, he was a college professor. Now the charter members uh, originally assigned their membership numbers in alphabetical order. So a uh, dad always had a, a fairly low number. Uh, and he was number two for many, many years, about 40 years or so. And in 1992, when Forrest Crossan died, you know, dad uh, uh, became, got the membership card number one. Now, my brother Herb has membership card number eight. It'd be nice if he got us up to number one, but of course, we don't know about the future. I was not in Denver from 1962 to 2009. So uh, I joined the club in 2010. And so 
I have number 263. Oops. All right, here's Dick Kendig in 1951 with his hat cocked in the way that he always wore it. Uh, he was born in 1916 in Denver, and his father had been uh, working for the CNS and later a conductor on the Union Pacific. And Dick took his first photograph in 1934, and it's estimated that he took more than 50,000 railroad photos uh, in his lifetime. Uh, he was a, a club officer uh, at various years. And one of the nice things was that in the 1950s, he would bring his slide projector and over to the uh, Edwards home and show us uh, his latest uh, photos. Now here's a letter he wrote to my dad in 1939. Uh, and he talks about the arrival of the Union Pacific uh, 8, 820s. It talks about the Rio Grande engines that are running on the DNSL, the recent trip he made to Gunnison and the engines that he saw there. And later, let, later, later letters tell of his experiences as an army private uh, in World War II. He had a great sense of humor. And then he was sent to India at the, toward the end of the, of the World War. Now in later years, uh, he had no use for diesel locomotives he was upset at the abandonment of uh, railroad passenger trains. And so he called the uh, DNRGW uh, the dirty and ragged, greasy wrecks. Now, my book is not a book of photographs, but I've included a few that you may not have seen. And here's a Kindig photo in 1941 of the Milwaukee Road 484 uh, pulling the Hiawatha. Now this is Jim Gwynn, and Jim Gwynn is really a forgotten charter member. And I suspect that my brother Herb and I are the only people west of the Mississippi now that knew and remember Jim Gwynn. Uh, he, his father was James G. Gwynn, who was chief engineer of the Rio Grande for about 20 years. And uh, Jim uh, was born in Denver in 19, 1909. And, uh, the reason he's forgotten here in the railroad club is that he moved to St. Louis in 1948 and worked for the uh, Missouri Pacific. Now he met my dad in junior high school here in Denver and they remained fast friends for over 70 years. And my dad saved nearly 300 letters and cards that Jim had sent him over the years, starting in 1926. Now here's a picture in 1947, the Railroad Club excursion through the Black Canyon from Salida to uh, Cimarron. And that's Jim on the left and my dad on the right and Jim's young son here in front of the 499. Now I want you to notice the way men dressed in those days for excursions, straw hats, coats and ties, leather shoes. I don't know if that was it for respect to respect the uh, narrow gauge of uh, the Rio Grande or, or what the reason was, but they, they dressed very well. And uh, you've all been on excursions in recent days and the, uh, the, the standards of dress have declined greatly since 1947. Here's a letter Jim wrote in 1945 uh, on Rio Grande stationery. He worked for the Rio Grande for about 10 years. So he and Jack Thode were contemporaries. And uh, in it, he talks about his job he talks about the uh, the scrapping of DNRG steam engines at Alamosa, Salt Lake, Grand Junction, and Pueblo. And he was very interested in the uh, coaches uh, on the uh, the railroads. He, he talks a lot about the uh, the interior decorations of, of the coaches. He was also very interested in Denver streetcars, and he gives a lot of details of the streetcars that he rode in the 1930s and 1940s. So I have about 90 letters of Jim's, or, or quotations from about 90 letters. And one letter was 14 pages, a handwritten letter of 14 pages. And Jim kept in touch with Colorado. He came here on summer vacations. And here he is, my dad's on the left and Jim's on the right, on the top of Cumbries Pass in 1973. All right, here's the incomparable Otto Perry. 
He needs no introduction to this audience, and so I'm certainly not going to give him one, but I do have short biographical sketches of these five gentlemen uh, in the book. Now, Otto, uh, you know, his movies, I think they were 16 millimeters, is that right? You know, in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, in the Railroad Club, there were a lot of, a lot of times uh, that Otto, Otto Perry's movies were shown to uh, club members. Now, he was a, a secretary for the Railroad Club in the 1940s and helped keep it going during the war years when so many uh, Railroad Club members, you know, were not in Denver. So here's a picture taken shortly after the club was founded on the uh, Monarch branch. And Perry's 20,000 plus railroad negatives, you know, are now at the Denver Public Library. And they were cataloged and organized by Dick Kindig, Jack Thode, and Ed Haley. Now, here's, Perry didn't write very often to my dad. You know, he was a man of few words. He's got a stamp up there that says the Rocky Mountain Railroad Club uh, um, meets uh, in the Rio Grande building at 1551 Stout Street. He needs to apply a little more ink to, uh, to the stamp that he made. And he didn't believe in paragraphs. He packed everything here in the one long paragraph. He talks about a couple of railroad club meetings in 1943. And he mentions that he'd sent some Hershey bars to Les Logue for Christmas. And he heard Les Logue was a charter member of the, of the club. And then he, took, and he mentions the DU Oklahoma Aggie football game. So he must have been a, a football fan as well. All right, on the left is Jack Thode, and on the right is Mac Poor. Now, Mac Poor was not an original charter member, but he joined uh, certainly after. And we all know about his book on the South Park that the club published in 1949. This picture was taken near Alpine Tunnel in 1940. Now, Jack Thode uh, was born in Denver in 1916 and joined the Rio Grande around 1935 and worked for about 40 years uh, with the Grand. And I'm sure you know about the great effort he made to preserve Rio Grande records that were headed for the company Dumpster. Uh, and then he was a great expert on Rio Grande history. And the letters here are at the Colorado Museum that I read. And his son, Kirk, who's here, does everybody know Kirk? Everybody knows Kirk, all right. Uh, Kirk donated those letters to the, to the Colorado Railroad Museum. And so I've got uh, samples of his letters from 1941 to 2001. So next we have a 1940, so, so these letters again were not written by my dad because again, except for five or six years during World War II and after, my dad was here in Denver. So these, these letters that Jack wrote to other people that corresponded with him. And here's a letter in 1963 headed to Australia, no doubt. People wrote him from Australia asking for information. Uh, and, and Jack is talking, he mentions a Rio Grande roster that he and Dick Kindig have been working on for many, many years. And then later on, he talks about the, uh, the Shays that once operated on the Rio Grande. So his letters, too, are a, a, a treasure of, of all kinds of facts and figures about the Rio Grande, primarily about the Rio Grande. And so here, here's Jack in 1978. Uh, he had a lot of, he was interested in cameras. He and he and Dick Kindig and Otto Perry, you know, had photo uh, duplicate uh, photo printing labs in their basements. All right, here's a, a again a June 1940 picture. Front left is uh, Jack Thode. Next to him is Mac Poor, and next to him is Les Logue, who was also a, a charter member. I think I forgot to mention that uh, Kindig Thode and Logue were all students together in junior high school in Denver in the 1930s. In the back row is a man named Kenny Shine. I've been able to find nothing about him. Next is Dick Kindig, notice wearing his hat, tilted the way he always wore it, and Johnny Maxwell, who was a, a, another early member of the club. So here, here's a book written about our, our, for, our forebears, uh, written for the railroad club members to appreciate uh, what these men did, their tra travels, their comments about. Uh, Rolling stock, 
uh, about train operations and so on, 30, 40. Well, actually, we're talking about 60, 70, 80 years ago. I have copies on the, on the back table. And I want to thank uh, Jim Ehrenberger and Dave Goss and my brother Herb and Kirk Thode, who read chap parts of chapters of, of the book. And Jim and Kirk also provided some, uh, some photographs. And with Denny's permission, I'll bring a few copies uh, next, next month, too. If any of you are interested and live in Denver, I'll make you a special offer tonight. You fill out a form there, and I'll, I'll personally deliver a copy to your, uh, to, to your home. Now, since I still have the floor, I want to go another 60 seconds, if I might. All right, anyway, so here, here, here are the details. Can anybody identify this locomotive? All right, it's a Garrett. It was made by Byer Peacock in Manchester, England in 1932. And 50 years later, it was one of the last in the world that was still operating. And where was it operating? In far off Nepal. And here is a Hunslet engine made in Leeds, England in 1962. It's an 0.62 tank engine. And you see that in 1981, there were no safety regulations uh, uh, in, in Nepal. Now, the, the reason I, I show you these two pictures is because just last week, I got some copies of a book that I've been working on for about eight years. I, go to, I first went to Nepal in 1966 as a Peace Corps volunteer. And I've gone back since I've retired every year, and I undertook to research the subject of Nepal's narrow gauge railways, which nobody has really written about. I don't expect much interest in the United States, but there are people in the UK and Europe that have gone to India and ridden the Darjeeling train and have ridden this train. In fact, you know, this was not my, those were not my pictures. So if you're interested in thumbing through it, there's a copy on the back table as well. So again, I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Good stuff. Good stuff. And like you said, there's a long, uh, long history of uh, connections there with the Rocky Mountain Railroad Club. Um, I guess we could just move into uh, Mr. McMillan's presentation as soon as these guys have a minute to switch over. Um, we're still we're still getting used to the uh, the way that this works of uh, meeting in person and st streaming it out to uh, those of you that are watching it on Zoom and YouTube. Hopefully it's uh, not too rocky. We're doing doing what we can. We're new at this, you know. As we said, it's been a year and a half since we actually got to uh, meet these folks in person. So. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, Joe McMillan. Good evening, good evening. Happy to spend a few uh, minutes with you tonight. I want to uh, introduce you to a book I've just completed called Coastlines and Valley Freights. Um, some of you may know I've done a series on the Santa Fe, six volumes, and this is the sixth and last volume. It, called, it covers the state of California. I have a few copies back there and you can save yourself 10 bucks or so if you wanna buy it. It's an expensive book and I'll tell you why nobody should be publishing a book during COVID. This book cost a fortune to do. Everything about it was uh, more expensive, the paper, transportation, everything. The, um, on the way down from, it was printed here in Denver but we have it bound in Tucson. And on the way down, the printed uh, pages sat in a truck in Phoenix for 10 days before they could find a driver to take it to Tucson. So when it came time for the book that was finished and bound to get back to Denver, we tried to find a way to get it back here without waiting another 10 days. So it cost me $1,200 to uh, hire an old Dominion truck line to bring the book to Denver as the only cargo on the truck was that. So it cost me $1,200 to get the book back, but I probably got it here 
two weeks earlier than it would have otherwise. Anyway, so that's kind of the story, and that's also kind of the story of why it cost a lot of money. It's also our, the largest book that we've ever done. It's uh, 348 pages, 648, I think, photographs, something like this. And so what I want to do tonight is just show you some pictures uh, taken from the book. Um, we're just going to kind of take a look at California. It's Santa Fe in California. And um, just kind of hop around the state there a little bit so you can get an idea of what the book is like. And um, I guess we can get started. There's my clicker. Okay. This uh, will start at uh, probably a good place to start. We'll start at, uh, at uh, Topak, Arizona, right here. And then we're going to come down and go to Barstow down and do Southern California here, go back to Barstow and go on up the Valley Division to San Francisco. So we're starting at Needles, California. The first picture was at <clears throat> Topak. This is at, at Needles, California. This is an early days of Amtrak. And this is the super chief or whatever they were calling it at that particular time before they changed the name of it. And during the night, it had all kinds of storms across the Mojave Desert. So all the signals were out, all the signals were red. They had to stop at each signal before they proceeded and all that, all the way across the desert. So it took all night. So the train's running here about six hours late, but it gave us an opportunity to, to photograph it because it usually comes through needles about two o'clock in the morning. This is one of the first sightings uh, west of Needles. This is at, at uh, Java, California. And this is uh, one of two of the last stock trains to run on the LA division. I, I managed to photograph both of them, but this one was the uh, first of, of two of them. The other one followed about a, a week later. This was in 1972, and there was this is the very, very last of stock movements on Santa Fe. And at the same location, about the same year, this is a solid train of ice reefers, which for that late date in 72 was uh, kind of unusual to see a train entirely composed of these cars. And it's very well, these cars could all be going to scrap. I don't know. I don't remember the circumstances of the train, but it was an entire train of just uh, ice reefers. You can see a track rider giving, giving the crew a wave there. The train is underpowered, and so they stuck them in the siding, the westward siding at Java for a while until they figured out what they were going to do. During the, um, during the summer of 1972, Amtrak ran a, a Chicago to Los Angeles passenger train called the Chief, named after the Santa Fe's Chief. And this train came through westbound in Needles in the afternoon, so it was always a, a uh, uh, ideally lit for, for pictures. And this is at Ibis, California, sighting of Ibis. Also at Ibis, uh, the chief is uh, passing a uh, westbound freight and the sighting at I Ibis. The chief at uh, a few miles west of Ibis at a place called Arrowhead Junction. It's a junction, it's a highway junction between Old Highway 66 and Route 95 to Las Vegas. It's not a railroad location, but it's a highway location, but it's a good, good place to shoot trains. This is at Golf's Hill. Back in the old days, it was called Paiute Summit. And this is a high and wide load. You're, you're familiar with that, of course. A lot of times, uh, uh, equipment that uh, shipments that are too large uh, are handled by a special train like this because they have to be very careful when you meet another train. So, uh, in this particular case, uh, I'm riding the train. I was assistant train master out there for several years. And so, this was one of the things I did is ride these trains. 
This is at Cady's, California. <clears throat> uh, at the end of the uh, Amtrak lease of Santa Fe engines, they gathered up the, the uh, F, F units and sent them to Texas to be converted to CF7s or converted over to freight service. So I just happened to be at Katie's one time when they had 13 of them on this freight train heading east. Now we take a little journey down the, the uh, Katie's district. At Katie's, uh, there is a branch line that runs down to uh, Parker, Arizona and on to Matthew, Arizona. So trains can uh, take a shortcut from say Barstow to Phoenix by taking this route. This is uh, what we call the Parker Local East. Uh, went from Barstow to Phoenix. This is a place called Milligan. It's on that branch, Katie's district. Uh, Milligan was known for its large uh, salt deposits. Uh, and uh, they shipped lots of hopper cars out of here of salt to Los Angeles to uh, soften water. This is water softener salt here and they, they no longer do this but it was a busy place for many years this is the same place the crew is uh, setting out a boxcar here and there was a branch off the branch at a place called rice a branch ran down to blythe california and the most scenic place on that branch was this place called sticks s-t-y-x and this is the uh, Parker local uh, making a side trip to Blythe. This is the station at Blythe. The crew's getting ready to do some switching, getting their instructions from the station. Uh, this used to be a, a very uh, large area for uh, truck farming, especially cantaloupes and all that. It was so busy at times they had their own switcher down here and trains from the main line would make detours down here to pick up uh, refrigerator cars or refrigerator trailers or whatever. But that business is pretty well all gone to trucks and there's really nothing much in Blythe anymore. Matter of fact, the railroad's been abandoned. But this is a station there and uh, uh, a couple of years after this picture was taken, it was burned to the ground. Now we're going back up to the main line, up, back up to Katie's again on the main line. And uh, for a while, we were experiencing some mysterious derailments. And the people could not uh, determine what was causing these accidents. Finally, after an exhaustive study, they found out that the that, uh, trains that were going over <clears throat> the line and the rail would be undulating under the wheels of the train like rails do. And it was working sand in under the rail between the rails and the tie plates. And eventually it just lifted the rail out of the tie plates. So then we had a wide gauge situation and trains were derailing. So in order to control the sand, they took a couple of these steam generator cars, linked them together and, get, and um, built a nozzle system on one of them to blow the sand from the track. We also planted tamarack trees, salt cedars, all on the right of way here for several miles and installed a, a watering system from Katie's, which is back here in the trees here, to water those trees. They grew, grew very fast and it wasn't very long that they could, they could uh, sustain uh, growth on their own. So those trees are quite large now. Here's a close up of the nozzle system on one of the cars. This is at Amboy, the next station uh, west of uh, Katie's. Uh, these desert communities had no source of water. So the Santa Fe had a um, location at Newberry Springs, which was east of Barstow where there was a spring and where there was a well. And we would load these cars with water and the local would take them out and distribute them to the various little towns out in the desert area. And that was our 
drinking water. On one of the, one occasion um, where we were experiencing a strike, um, I had to take a local out. Uh, myself, engineer, and one other guy. We had to take a local out from Newberry Springs to these towns and distribute these water cars. The, the strike had gone on for five or six days, and these towns were running out of water. So we had to we had to pick up cars at Newberry Springs and bring them out here. This is uh, near, um, this is west of Amboy, westbound intermodal. This is Siberia. They certainly didn't name it uh, for the temperature that you would find out in the middle of the Mojave Desert. At Mojave, the two main lines separated. The original, original line veered far to the north and the new line to the south. So this is always a good place for photography. This picture here is the Parker Local West rounding the curve at Klondike, which is on the old main line. At that's the point where the uh, tracks are separated. And this is how it looks from the hillside, you have a south, you have an eastbound train way in the distance, an intermodal going by. And then this train here is a westbound. Nice place for pictures, but you want to make sure you take water out there when you, when you go out there. And also, it's very sandy out there. So you have to be sure you have a, a vehicle that can handle that. This is at Ash Hill, California. This is the top of a hill, it used to be called Squaw Summit. And uh, two trains have met here, and there, one train is giving another a locomotive. So just do a little switching here. This is also at Ash Hill. Back in this day, we had uh, um, a block system. Um, the tracks uh, were eastward tracks and westward tracks, and so you could not run an eastward train on the westward track without going through a procedure of, of giving a train a train order. In this case, this train is coming up. It's going to get a train order. It's going to come by the photographer and then back through that crossover to uh, go on the uh, uh, eastward track. And they had to do this, what they call single tracking, to go around uh, maintenance projects or accidents or something. So it wasn't very common, but it was a procedure to set it up because you had to have train order operators on both ends and all. And usually I would find myself out at these occasions. This is at Ludlow, California. It's a good place to take pictures because there's some nice little hills there. The Tonopah and Tidewater came here. It's their grade came into town here. Of course, they disappeared, I think, in the 1930s or 40s. Or, but the, the right of way can still be seen there. This is at Lavik, the next station uh, west of there. This is uh, a bare table train carrying uh, empty uh, TOFC cars west. This particular train obviously has Conrail power. And uh, you're riding the Super C eastbound, meeting a westbound at Hector. And this is uh, the, uh, the uh, old Harvey house at Barstow in 1964. This is taken from Santa Fe's chief there. So you can see all of the uh, express there that's going to be loaded. It's obviously getting close to Christmas time. This was, this was near Thanksgiving, so it's getting close to that time of year, so a lot of packages. We're in Barstow now. This is the old shops at Barstow. These have since been torn down in favor of a new shop built west of here. And this is a new yard built 1972, 71, 72, out uh, west of uh, town there a little bit. 
And so now we're going to, uh, we're at Barstow right here, and we're going to come down to San Bernardino. Here. This is riding a train called the LAF, the Los Angeles Forwarder. This is uh, eastbound out of uh, Los Angeles near Victorville. And this is uh, 1991 when the 3751 was making its first uh, fan trip. It made a fan trip, a four day trip between Los Angeles and Bakersfield. And this is on the way back, coming across uh, those two twin uh, through truss bridges, which were replaced in March of this year. Summit, the Hone Summit, you've all heard of that, I'm sure. Uh, that that uh, that uh, that sign right there is uh, one of my prized possessions. It's a it's a long story how I got it, but uh, I I got it legally. Just to make sure you know that. This is a Super C at uh, Summit, eastbound. This is Old Summit. And this is a freight uh, uh, in a siding and Super C coming up alongside of it at Summit. Again, this is Old Summit. This is a westbound with a SD24 on the point. In 1972, they built a new route through here. And you can see the construction is already started right here. And the summit is going to be about, it's going to be 50 feet lower than the summit up here. And it's going to come right, right through here. And this is a, uh, the leg of one of the Y's right here, a leg of the Y. It's already been removed. And this is the new summit. Two trains meeting there. Same same location. The old track was right up here, right up through there. They restored the contour of the old the old track, so it's very difficult to tell where the old track went now. This is a Merck's train is one of our GP60Ms that, uh, that we painted uh, to Merck's colors. It remained in this uh, scheme for about a month while uh, Merck uh, contracted for some TV commercials in Southern California. And I, I flew out there one day and uh, two days, I guess, and spent with it. This is it coming out of the one of the tunnels there west of Cajon, uh, west of uh, Summit. Another shot of it. This is an eastbound freight coming out of the tunnel. A third, a third main track. Gosh. Picture the wrong thing. A third main track is being built built along here now. This is the Southern Pacific SP up here. The third main track was added about 2008 through here. So these tunnels were all daylighted through here now. So this looks entirely different. This is an Amtrak uh, train uh, built in uh, San Diego and uh, it's headed for the New, New York for their empire service. Another eastbound. And uh, as I mentioned, there's a the third main track is built right alongside here right now. So this looks quite a bit different. In the 50th anniversary or at the 50th anniversary of the LAU PT, Los Angeles Union Passenger Terminal, uh, the 44 to 49 and the 844 came out to help in the celebration. At the end of the celebration, they were going to run, they're, run side by side up Cajon Pass 
for the benefit of the photographer snow. And so this is showing that I'm standing on one of the tunnels here. This is the um, this is a Santa Fe track, and this is a UP SB track here. There was a jillion people waiting up at the summit for this uh, this thing to happen, but just beyond this point where I am, um, the uh, 44. 4449 had some mechanical problems, and so they had to stop or slow down. So all those people up at, up at the summit were quite disappointed not to be able to see these trains running side by side. And down below, this is Cajon, Cajon siding, eastbound. This is coming into San Bernardino. This is San Bernardino, is it? as it uh, looks now, uh, this was taken in 2018. It's quite a bit, uh, quite a bit different. This is, these tracks over here all belong to Metrolink, which is the commuter system for the LA area. And uh, this is their through track right here. This is the old Santa Fe's old A yard, which most of it has been converted to piggyback these days. This is in San Bernardino, of course, was home to San Bernardino shops, one of our one of our primary heavy shops on the railroad. This was a painting of the uh, first uh, bicentennial unit, first Santa Fe bicentennial unit. 5990 at FP45. There's switchers that are stored at the shops. These were, these were going to be rebuilt. This is an RS-1 uh, handling some military equipment in the B yard at San Bernardino. The 2394 was assigned for years as a passenger switcher at San Diego. But after, after the coming of Amtrak, it was not needed. And so it, it uh, found its way up to Los Angeles and San Bernardino, and it was just, just considered a regular switcher like all the other Alco switchers around there. Now we're gonna come down from San Bernardino, we're gonna come down into Los Angeles area on what was called the third district down here. And we're going to take a, we'll take a trip down here to San Diego and, and uh, we'll also come to the, uh, Harbor, Los Angeles, Wilmington Harbor here. Take a look at this area here. This is Santa Ana Canyon, just uh, uh, not far outside Los Angeles. This is a three track main line now, and uh, as opposed to uh, single track, like it's shown here. It's a pretty busy line now because the, the, the Metrolink service has a lot of trains that come through here. So they have greatly expanded the tracks through here. This is a Placentia station at Placentia, California. It was uh, torn down just shortly after this picture. This is Fullerton, California. Uh, at the time, um, they were building an underpass behind me and the main line uh, normally went right through here, but they built a shoe fly through the parking lot of the station during the time that the underpass was built. So it's kind of unusual to see the trains going through the parking lot like this. And the, um, the uh, station area is completely, completely changed. The city purchased the, purchased the station and completely remodeled it and this is kind of what it looks like today. It's almost totally unrecognizable from the old days. And they've even added another main track through here since then. And there's also a uh, um, overhead pedestrian bridge right down here too. So it's really a train watcher's paradise. If you ever find yourself out there and just want to spend a few hours looking at trains, 
because you got an Amtrak and you got the Metrolink and you got BNSF and everything else on this on this line. They're great places. Spend a day. This is Pico Rivera, one of several stations in the Southern California area that received this uh, red paint with white trim. This station is uh, still around, but it's not at this location. It's been moved off site. This is a Super C leaving Los Angeles, eastbound. I think we're going to go down to the harbor now. We're going to go down to San Diego from Redondo Junction here, down to LA, down to San Diego. This is a Redondo Tower. This was a, a, a UP industrial branch that uh, crossed the Santa Fe here. This is the Santa Fe to third district going to Fullerton out that way. And this is the line going to Harbor and to the Los Angeles Harbor. This is Anaheim. A lot of these stations are gone or completely changed or changed into uh, transportation centers now. This is Anaheim again. This is uh, obviously a San Diego that suffered some sort of a problem and being helped along with the freight engine. San Juan Capistrano, you've probably heard of that place. In the uh, depot is designed to uh, design like the mission that's nearby, you know, where the swallows come by, I think on March 19th or something like that. So that was uh, why this was designed that way. What's that? No, it's not my Cadillac. No, wow. Well, mine's, mine's a different color. <laughs> this is a San Diego at San Clemente. This is a 20 car train Santa Fe at this time. We're, we're running uh, some San Diegans with 20 cars. This is at Del Mar. Del Mar, the train leaves the station and immediately uh, curves onto a bluff right above the ocean. This is Miramar Hill. This is a northbound train. The tracks veer away from the uh, <clears throat> from the uh, ocean and climb the climb Miramar Hill, and then then the tracks uh, descend into San Diego. And this is where this picture was taken, San Diego. This area has completely changed too since the, this day. Uh, all this platforms have been rebuilt now, and the, the San Diego trolley goes through in front of the depot here or the station. This is barely recognizable from what it is now. And that, on a branch line off the San Diego line to Escondido, again, a couple of these red and white stations. One here at Escondido and the other one at Vista. Now we're going to, uh, I think, go down to the harbor area here, Long Beach. Maybe look first, I think we're going to go to uh, um, Redondo Junction, the roundhouse, and all right, Redondo Junction, then go down here. Redondo Junction. Uh, roundhouse, an area where Santa Fe engines were serviced for years and years and years. And in 1971, all this facility was sold to Amtrak. And so Am Santa Fe started servicing its engines at Hobart Yard. And then later on, they built a servicing area out at Commerce. So the only thing you'll find here these days are Amtrak. But in 1971 and 72, you can always get some nice shots around there. Alco switchers were what it was all about in those days, the principal switchers for the Los Angeles area. No sand house, certainly not there anymore. This is a Hobart yard, yard office. That um, was uh, 
my office right here in the corner, the one with the air conditioner. It's where I spent several years at night. I was a night, night uh, train master here for a couple of years. Couple of EMD yard engines. This is the train master tower. I mean the yard master's tower in Hobart. This is uh, Super C. The Super C had its own track at uh, Hobart Yard. It came in and departed from. And that was one of my principal jobs was to make sure that train got in and out okay. Now we're going to take a little trip down to the harbor. This is Inglewood Station. It had already suffered a fire, and, but, and uh, it stayed this way for a little bit, and then it was torn down. And this is down in the uh, San Pedro area, down the harbor. This is a train of uh, copper concentrate going to a ship that's waiting for it down there. The white stuff in the cars was a material they put in to uh, uh, provide a coating over the copper concentrate so it wouldn't blow out of the cars when it was in transit. And this is uh, at San Pedro. This is engines, probably the same three engines uh, on a string of empties to take back to the yard down there. This is a Harbor Belt line, which was operated by the Union Pacific. And uh, we're taking a cut of cars back to our yard from there. And our yard was at uh, Watson. And uh, the primary function down there, we had lots of industries to serve down there and also uh, ships. We had to uh, carry all kinds of uh, bullet materials to either Long Beach or San Pedro har harbors for various ships. Now I think we're gonna go to Los Angeles uh, proper up here on First Street, Los Angeles, then we're gonna go out to second, second District here. This is usually the passenger main, or was in the old days, the passenger main. This is that inaugural trip with the 3751 <clears throat> uh, leaving uh, Los Angeles. That's uh, Mission Tower back here. This has just come out of the station. And this is uh, four days later, as the engine, as the train was just coming back into Los Angeles, it'll pull by, pull by me, and then uh, back into the station. This is San Diego, heading south. This is uh, some uh, power for San Diego trains. You'll notice that. Uh, there are three tracks here. There's a, two uh, platform tracks, and then this is an escape track right in the middle here. So a train could come in and the engines could cut off the train and come out through these tracks and be serviced while the train was still being unloaded or vice versa. The train could be here and the engines could come from the roundhouse and couple to the train, you know, uh, worked out pretty good. There were three, uh, platforms where there were escape tracks here at the Union Station. This is uh, also at Union Station. The SP train was a 20 car um, excursion train to Bakersfield that day. And the Santa Fe was a 20 car San Diego, leaving for San Diego. And for a short period, this is how they were running Amtrak's uh, uh, Southwest Chief with the FP-45 and then an F-45 or sometimes a uh, F-7B unit. <clears throat> but shortly after this Amtrak got its own power and they were able to return these to Santa Fe. This is also during that celebration at, for Union Terminal's uh, 50th anniversary that these diesels line up. 
And this is the Pasadena station, also for that 1991 uh, 3751 trip. Pasadena station is totally unrecognizable now. The station itself is still there, but it is now a restaurant and it's completely surrounded on three sides by um, condominiums and apartments and things like that. And there's no uh, rail service here except for um, light rail. Light rail comes through here. So this is it was a rather drastic change. Here's a look at a couple of stations on the second district. Monrovia. And there's Azusa. Azusa used to be kind of a nice looking station until somebody got a hold of it, rebuilt into a shoebox. Cucamonga. Used to be a lot of grapes shipped out of Cucamonga. This is Claremont. This station, uh, all this track, of course, now is a light rail. There's no Santa Fe or BNSF trains over here now. And uh, so this station was completely refurbished by the city now and is now a part of the light rail station area. Now I think we're going to go to uh, back to Barstow and we're going to just hit up the Valley Division here. And I think our first stop is uh, Am uh, Boron. Uh, Boron's a site of a very large borax plant. You have a spur that runs out there and we have locals that come out and switch that. When I first saw the Boron station, this is how it looked. A few years, a couple of years later, it looked like this. The station ex still exists. There's a museum across the tracks to the north, and the station is sitting there now. But of course, it's no longer an open agency here. Edwards Air Force Base Station, it was closed at this time, and it was torn down very shortly thereafter. Uh, Edwards Air Force Base is, of course, where a lot of rockets are, are launched and all that. And we have a, a spur or two that run, run back in there. 3751 heading to Bakersfield. We soon find ourselves at Mojave where the Santa Fe trains uh, run on the Southern Pacific to Bakersfield. This is a joint station. It was a joint station between the Santa Fe and the SP. It has since been torn down. This is a northbound Santa Fe at Warren. And this is a cable. It's a little short distance of CTC control track. And uh, there is a uh, crossover right here. Matter of fact, this train is crossing over. And this train's waiting, doesn't declare. And of course, no visit to the hatch would be, would be complete without going to the loop. And this place is called Waylong. Here's a, a job uh, with a bunch of flat cars. We've got nine units on it, so it should be sufficient. The Southern Pacific San Joaquin is, is uh, passing a, an SP freight here in the siding at Waylong. The SP freight was having some problems. So Santa Fe train uh, left its Santa Fe units, left its train at the next siding below and came up and helped push the SP train into the siding so it would clear for this passenger train. As soon as the passenger train is, is uh, by and as soon as the SP train is able to proceed on its own, the Santa Fe units uh, will go back and pick up its own train. Probably something's not very uncommon there at all. This is uh, just below the loop, crossing of the Hatchapi Creek. Beoville, have a neat place. Makes for good target practice too. This is a 
1971, this was the last few days of Southern Pacific F units on Tachapi. These were assigned to uh, helper service there for a bit. This is a, you know, the uh, helpers in the siding back down there that in a train with SD uh, uh, nines or sevens coming by the old uh, uh, Sexton house there, which also disappeared shortly after this picture. That's in the Beelville siding northbound. Same. This is exiting tunnel two, FP45. It's kind of fallen for great, fallen from grace to be used. Uh, great service like this. I'm riding an SP, that SP excursion to Bakersfield, and we're passing a Santa Fe northbound at Caliente. Bakersfield old station at Bakersfield. This is 3751 overnighting there at Bakersfield. Next station up is Fresno. And Calway is Calway Yard is the Fresno Yard. Riverbank, Stockton, California. Very attractive station there. Stockton also was home to the Stockton Tower. The Stockton Tower uh, was Santa Fe across the Southern Pacific and the Western Pacific. This is at Middle River. Uh, when you're in this part of the Delta, they call it, uh, west of uh, Stockton, you feel like you're in uh, Louisiana with all the swamps and the canals and little islands and everything else that's out there. This fellas. Got his groceries, he's going to take to his uh, boat house over there. This is from the Middle River Bridge. This is a mile long trestle here between uh, the Middle River and Orwood. You barely see Orwood lift bridge right there. This is between two islands. There's an island at Orwood. Uh, they have uh, people on duty there because there's a large uh, marina south of the south of the tracks and um, those folks uh, like to take their boats out to open water someplace and so they have to cross under the Santa Fe out there so they've got a lift bridge here and this bridge this guy here is uh, at the little CTC machine passage over the over the bridge and I want to read you the guy's hat there because you probably can't read it. It says, have you hugged your cesspool man lately? <laughs> Came from someplace, someplace in Pennsylvania, so I don't know where he got the hat. Anyway, this is in Martinez, California, the Alhambra Bridge or the Muir Trestle crosses over a creek and a couple of streets. This is a westbound train. And this is a westbound coming out of the Franklin Tunnel, which is a tunnel through the coastal mountains. And from here, it's pretty well downhill to the end of the railroad at Richmond. This is a station at Richmond. Most, most all of this has been torn out now. This giant uh, auto facility now where where um, automobiles imported and exported. But back in 1970, we had the uh, San Francisco chief there being met by one of the Santa Fe train buses that they'll take the passengers over to uh, across the Bay Bridge to San Francisco. And of course, San Francisco was home to Santa Fe's uh, Navy. Um, at this time, this was right at the last of it. Um, we were down to one tug and one barge. 
and um, freight was uh, hauled from Richmond to China Basin in San Francisco at the time. And uh, since there was only one tug and one barge, the barge was, was uh, always uh, tied up to the tugboat. But I was there one day and, and I wanted to get pictures of all this. So the guys were real nice and they, they uh, untied the barge and left it in the slip. And then they made a real slow turn out in the bay so I could take pictures of both sides of the tugboat. And I also wanted to write it, so uh, we did that. This is uh, uh, San Francisco way back here in the background. It's about an hour and 10 minute trip from, from Richmond to China Basin in San Francisco. So I'm standing on the barge here, standing on the barge. We don't have any cars that we're taking over, but we're going to go over and pick up some and bring back. So I would just, uh, uh, hop over from the boat and take a few pictures and hop back and all that kind of stuff. So it was, it was a great ride. This is in a wheelhouse of the tugboat. And uh, I might mention that the tugboat is now in about uh, uh, 80 fathom, fathoms of water out in the Pacific. When the Santa Fe uh, went out of the barge business in 1984 because the slip there at Richmond burned. And once that happened, they abandoned all the rest of their barge service and sold the boat. They sold the boat to a company and the boat was uh, refitted with a couple of they added a couple engines to it. I could never figure out how they could have possibly added a couple engines to a boat that already had two engines. But they refitted it, and it was out in the Pacific uh, laying a fiber optic cable for this company. And the storm came up, and the tow line between the barge that was laying the cable and the tug broke. And uh, the uh, barge punctured a big hole in the side of the tugboat because it collided and then the tug sank. So after all that work, put new engines in this thing and everything else, and this was on the first trip, first job that the boat had, now it's in the bottom of the ocean. So that's what I got. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Any, I'll take some questions. Yeah, sure. Okay, for those of you online, um, you should be able to ask a question as soon as I allow you to unmute yourself. So if anybody out there has questions, feel free to unmute and ask. And if anybody's in the room's got questions, pop your hand up and I'll give you the mic. Joe, I noticed that uh, some of the F units on the uh, number boards have the uh, number of the unit itself, and other, other units, other diesels, have the number of the train they're hauling. What determines whether they keep the original road units or the number of the that's train? Not the, that's not true on the Santa Fe. Those are engine numbers on the Santa Fe. We, we never did that. That was Southern Pacific and Union Pacific did that. If on the did, Santa Fe... That Santa Fe had like the 300 numbers for the F unit series. Yeah, that's the name of the engine. Yeah, number of the engine. But some of those had the train number on the 47C and all that. Is that no, also that's, a number? That's the engine number. It is really 47C. Okay. Passenger engines were numbered LABC. I see. Like 47L means lead, and then the B units were A and B, and then the fourth A unit was the C. So they had two different number series, in other words. Oh yeah, they, yeah. They, did. I see. they had the 16 series, they had the 37 series, and 300 series, and the 325 series and all, but those are all engine numbers. Thank you. So, yeah, at the uh, in the first third of your program, you had 
talking about the Parker local. Yeah. And there was a photograph that was predominantly blue and gray of a unit pulling a train up what appeared to be a very steep uh, grade with maybe a fog bank behind it. Do you recall that shot? It looked like an impossibly steep grade, but uh, I wondered if you had an explanation on that. Yeah, I'm not sure what it was. Way back. That, that right the first of the show. There was one shot, a far shot of the train kicking up a lot of dust with the mountains in the background. I don't know if that's the one you talked about or not. Joe, Wally, yeah. what, what killed off the, the Marine? There it is. That yeah. shot? Yes, sir. He's just coming up out of KD's and you, you see all the sand on the track. So he's kicking mm -hmm. up sand as he's coming along and those just the mountains in the background. Not a fog or anything. Those are mountains. No, it's just a, a funny angle on the train. It looks like about a 10% or something. It's a hill that's coming up. And yeah, I just wonder. Uh, maybe it's just. He's climbing out of the Katie's, Katie's Valley there. Thanks. Anybody else? Joe, what killed off the marine business besides obviously the slip burning? It's a the industry's out in that area just folded up and went away. Where is that now? Oh, the marine business in San Francisco. Yeah, that China, that China Basin area over there was a maze of warehouses. All kinds of warehousing and shipping and everything else. But in the starting in the 19 late 1970s, 1980s, San Francisco began clearing all of that out and building uh, um, what's there now, high-tech places like bio, uh, bio uh, medical places, uh, condos, and all that kind of stuff. So all the warehouses disappeared, and all the business went with them. And also, had the, had the fire not ended the barge service, economics was just about to anyway, because okay. there wasn't anything, there wasn't much to haul anymore. All those warehouses were gone. Yeah. Thanks, Joe. There was an article in Railroad Rail Fan a while back on all the marine services, and they talked about the Santa Fe's San Francisco service. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, in the old days, they've had as many as nine tugs and about that many barges, and they went to several places in San Francisco. They had several docking places, but at the time I wrote it, in 84, it was only one tug, one barge, and they had only one place to go, China Basin. Thanks, Joe. You bet. I got the book back there. If you want to page through it, you can take a look at it. I also brought some calendars today. Uh, the book, like I say, you can save 10 bucks tonight if you want to buy it. The calendars, if you want to buy one of them, it's $12. If you buy uh, more than one, then it's $10 each. So I've got them back there on the table if you're if you're interested. Okay, thank you, Joe. Great presentation. Thank you so much. All righty. Well, next month we've got a, a show. John Bush is going to come up from Chama, and he's going to do a program for us. Nineteenth uh, century. Railroad equipment in the 21st century. That should be uh, that should be pretty interesting. There, and as you may know, that they had uh, their Victorian Iron Horse uh, roundup uh, in the last few weeks down there, where they had uh, I think it was five engines that were all built before 1900, and some uh, older passenger equipment and that type of thing. So, very unusual happenings down at Chama this year, and interesting things going on at Durango. And uh, I know that there was just a Photo special out at Ely, Nevada with the Nevada Northern. They got their, uh, I believe it's Engine 81 running again for the first time in quite a while. So it's been pretty interesting in the last few years how many uh, steam engines have come back to life. The 
Big Santa Fe 2926 down in uh, Albuquerque is uh, up and running again. They don't have much track to run on, but uh, they're hoping to hoping to find a place for that too. All right. Uh, if, if nothing else, I guess we'll uh, sign off. Thank you for uh, joining us uh, from around the world. Uh, is, our, is our Australian friend out there, Nathan? <laughs> we'll wave back, John. Yeah, right. yes, I'm here. Thank you. <laughs> Lovely. All right. Good to see you. See, we 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 figured out how to do the live show and the uh, internet show just for you guys. It, it worked really well. Thanks. Good. Good. We're glad to hear it. See, now we may have sadly set the bar too high. We'll have to do this every time and uh, see if Nathan's not available. We're pretty much uh, dead in the water. <laughs> All right. I hope, you can, uh, I hope you can all see that it's daylight here in Melbourne. Yeah, it's in Melbourne, ladies and gentlemen. I guess we have no ladies here for once, but good to see you, John. Good. All right. Uh, I guess that uh, that does it. Uh, we will get out the chair rack, and if you guys would uh, hang up the chairs, I think these go sideways. We were so conditioned to hanging up those metal ones, the, the butt busters, that uh, now we have to learn a new plan. So, all right. Thanks. <laughs>